All right. Well, good afternoon, folks. Going to let um, give a, just a minute or so to let people log in and join and join us for this week's webinar. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics: the Health Equity and Accountability Act. It's something that I got um, the opportunity to, to work on firsthand as both a staffer and then um, from the nonprofit world. And so I, I may know a little bit about this about the HEAA, but our moderator, Britt Weinstock, has worked on it even longer than I have. She, uh, excuse me, Dr. Britt Weinstock has worked on it a, longer than I have, and she's been with it from, uh, I guess, from Mr. Cummings to Mr. Stokes uh, to Dr. Christensen to Dr. Kelly. Um, and now to Ms. Uh, Senator Hirono, uh, who's been one leading Congresswoman Barbara Lee and uh, Dr. Ami Barra, uh, who has been leading this bill. But HEAA is probably one of the, actually, in my opinion, the most significant piece of healthcare legislation that comes out every Congress. Uh, they're going to, the panelists are going to go a little deeper into it, but it's a collaborative effort, but not only with the Tri Caucus, but then the healthcare community in general. I'll get to work on it. So you'll hear from experts in this space. My job isn't to talk too much about that. I'm just going to get into a bit of housekeeping. If you have questions that you would like Britt to ask of the uh, panelists and have that answer, please do it in the Q&A box and we'll get to it. And if you just kind of want to keep the conversation going, you hear something and you want to put a link to a conversation or an article, please uh, place it in the chat box. But without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Weinstock, who will lead this conversation. Britt? Thank you, Brandon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Britt Weinstock. I'll, I'm the moderator for today. I'm a special advisor to the National Minority Equality Forum. Joining me, and I'm going to sort of say raise your hand when I call your name, is Joyce Liu, the policy advisor for the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum. Um, along with her is Adam Carb Carbolito, um, Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations. And last but not least, certainly, is Casey Lee, the Policy Director from the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Um, throughout this day, we will refer to that caucus as KPAC. So I'm just going to throw out that's the first acronym to let people know. And we are here today for this webinar, which is titled The Health Equity and Accountability Act, the Legislative Template for Equity. And we're here to talk about the bill that was just introduced. Um, in Congress this year, it was led, I think Brendan already mentioned, by um, Congressman Barbara Lee um, and in the Senate by Senator Hirano. Um, but let me just take a few seconds to do a deep dive on the history of this bill, because as Brandon mentioned, it's to say it's massive is an understatement. It's 1,700 pages long. Um, it's extremely comprehensive. And it's a bill that the Congressional Tri Caucus has led every congressional session since 2003. So for those of you who have not called the bills long, this is a bill that is, I think, a labor of love for so many people, and it's so valid, but also it's a bill that really touches um, so many populations in this country and could really um, take this nation so many significantly greater strides forward towards eliminating health disparities and really achieving meaningful health equity. So before I get into that, I want to quickly just explain who the Congressional Tri Caucus is. And I know that the, for those of us here, we kind of throw the term around. A lot of people don't really know who we who the Tri Caucus is and how long the Tri Caucus has been around. So the, the word tri implies three. That's correct. It's really comprised of the Congressional Black Caucus, which was established in 1971. Um, and the members are of African American descent, African descent. Um, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, which was established in 1976, and the members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus are, are members of Congress of Hispanic or Latino origin, and who also have a really have, have a dedicated um, passion for advocating on behalf of the Hispanic and Latino communities in the United States. And then last but not least is KPAC, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, which was established in 1994. But it is important to talk about this because um, KPAC number one is the only racial and ethnic minority caucus that has members who are not always of Asian or Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander um, descent, but who have districts that represent those communities and or have demonstrated a commitment to those communities. And that's why you have Congresswoman Barbara Lee as the lead in the House, quote unquote. She is both a CBC and a KPAC member. 
So, um, so the caucus is is large. It constitutes more than one fourth of the U.S. Congress today. I know KPAC and someone will speak to this just picked up two additional members, which is fantastic. Um, but you know, legislation is about so many things, but vote count is one of them. And so the Congressional Tri Caucus, when they band together, it's a really sizable force in Congress, and it's a, it sends a message when the entire Tri Caucus gets behind an initiative and really pushes for it. I'm going to give one example of how powerful it is and how fast moving it can be. And if I'm talking too fast, I'm going to try to slow down because I, I know I have limited time. But in December of 2019, the Congressional Tri Caucus recognized that in the congressional committees, not just health committees, all the committees, there was a sad dearth of racial and ethnic diversity among the people who were called to testify before any committee or subcommittee. This is important because usually at those hearings, what happens is that a piece of legislation is marked up, it gets voted out of that subcommittee or committee, and then it goes on its way to final vote and ideally to the president's desk. So when that diversity is not at the table, that means that those communities, racial and ethnic minority communities and the unique issues affecting those communities also are not at the table. So as legislation moves, if those issues are not addressed during a time when it could be amended or marked up, then opportunities for better change get lost. And so that letter was sent to all of the chairs and the ranking members of all committees on both sides of the aisle. So it was a, it was a red and blue uh, message that was being sent out and basically said, we're going to be asking for you to identify the diversity on your panels. And in 2020 and since 2020, the Tri Caucus has started to collect that data. Um, anyone who has seen a lot of these hearings now has seen an increase in diversity on those panels. And it really is a testament to what happens when the Tri Caucus bands together around something and means it. Um, and so I do think that for what we're talking about today, which is the Health Equity and Accountability Act, that's really important. So this bill started actually under a different name in 2003. Uh, in 2003, it was called the Healthcare Equality and Accountability Act. And it was really born out of the findings from the 2002 Unequal Treatment Report that IOM published. This report was, um, I mean, people call it landmark, game-changing. It was on the front page of the Washington Post. It was all of those things. Um, but for those of us who are health equity champions, it it was such a it was such a final something we needed to change the dialogue around health disparities and health equity because the report found that even among equally insured populations and even among populations who had the same types of disease the same state of condition lived in the same areas had the same levels of education all the social determinants of health that we all know affect health racial and ethnic minorities were still less likely to have access to the best care quality care, we're still less likely to have optimal health, health outcomes, and we're still more likely to die premature to, prematurely from often preventable diseases. So it helped change the narrative to say, this isn't just about not having insurance. This isn't just about being low income or having resources. This is about a bigger problem in the, in the healthcare system and across the healthcare continuum. And it also opened the door for us to talk about the role of implicit racial bias and other implicit biases that have integrated themselves into the healthcare system. So um, at that time when that report was released, the uh, great late uh, Congressman Elijah Cummings was from Maryland, was the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, um, always a collaborative member. He reached out to his tri-caucus colleagues and said, this is a problem, and this is a problem that our, that our districts, our constituents are feeling the most, and let's do something about it. And they did. And so they got together and they drafted the Healthcare Equality and Accountability Act. It was introduced in November of 2003, I believe. Um, and it had more than a quarter of all members in the U.S. House of Representatives signed on originally as co-sponsors. So it set the tone. This is, this is an issue that this large entity of voting members are going to be looking at. Um, not only did they drop that bill, they then realized the power of the Tri-Caucus. They decided then every congressional session, we're dropping a health disparity elimination product that will be known as the Tri-Caucus legislative effort to address health disparities. And every Congress since then, that has occurred. So the first bill was dropped in the 108th Congress. Every Congress since then, there has been a Tri-Caucus package dropped. Um, and they've rotated who the quote lead is. And we'll get into what we mean by lead. Um, but when Mr. Cummings introduced it, he was the lead sponsor and so it was the Congressional Black Caucus was the lead caucus leading it, even though the entire tri-caucus walked lockstep with them. So then the, in the 109th Congress, they rotated it. 
and they all, everyone still worked together. And then it was KPAC's turn to be the lead caucus. And the 110th, then there was a Hispanic caucus. Then 111th went back to the CBC and KPAC and CHC and so on to today's Congress. And this session, it was KPAC's turn to lead it again. So this history of the caucuses working together closely and leading this effort um, is, is over 20 years old. I mean, it's been around for a hot minute. Um, and it suffers, unfortunately, because a lot of people are unaware about how long this effort has been going and how consistent the Tri-Caucus has been at keeping the pressure on their colleagues to, to do more around this issue. Um, I will say that because the bill is girthic, it's substantial, um, it's many pages long, and anyone who's printed it out could probably do weight training with it. Um, it has been successful in a lot of ways that I think some people are aware of and some people are not. It's often referred to as a message bill because it is so big. But going back to the Tri-Caucus and how large the Tri-Caucus is and how effective these members are, throughout the various Congresses, there are members of the Congressional Tri-Caucus that sit often in very pivotal positions across all committees in Congress. And so when this legislation has a chance to move throughout those committees, they have leveraged their influence on their committees to pick pieces of the bill that are relevant to that committee's jurisdiction and move it. We've seen it through, you know, throughout since it's been introduced, but I think that everyone really saw it when the Affordable Care Act was signed into law. Um, at the time that the, the, the that that bill, which was also very girthic, um, was being drafted, if you look at who was sitting in Congress, both in the House and the Senate, and the committees that they sat on, there were several tri-caucus members who sat on committees that had core jurisdiction over the Affordable Care Act. And they ensured with the weight and, and, and support of their tri-caucus members that certain provisions that could get included on the final version that made it to President Obama's desk for signature did. Um, and so there are a number of provisions that were included in ACA that um, everybody rallied around and, and applauded, which was great. But those provisions actually started in the Tri-Caucus Health Disparity Bill many, many, many Congresses prior to that. So just a couple of examples. I'm not going to rattle through everything because I know that time is limited. But things like the um, elevation of the Office of Minority Health, you know, that started in the Tri-Caucus Bill. That, that office is now elevated into the office of the, of the HHS Secretary. Across HHS, in the Tri-Caucus Bill, many Congresses before that, there was a there was a move to create an office of minority health. It's now called sometimes the office of health equity across every single aspect of HHS. So we now see one at CDC. We see one at you know FDA. We see one you know at HRSA. We see one across all the entities at at HHS. And that started in the Tricaucus bill. We also saw, to the delight of many, the elevation of the National Center for Minority Health and Health Disparities at NIH to an institute that was so significant. And it wasn't just the elevation of the center to an institute, but it also has language in that ensures that the director of the institute has oversight, jurisdiction, and authority across NIH to be a part of or to weigh in on any research being conducted by other institutes um, that look at health disparities and or health equity issues. Um, we could go on and on, but another big one also was that um, there was a section that started in the Tricoc Disparities Bill um, that is in, included in ACA, but it's that any entity funded by the Department of Health and Human Services must collect and report um, data on race, ethnicity, and language preferences. That was a fight that the Tri-Caucus was, was pushing for and taking on every congressional session, because I think what a lot of folks may or may not know is that a lot of this data was being collected sort of inconsistently, not universally, but then worse than that, it was being collected yet never reported. And so the Tri-Caucus kept saying, what good is this valuable data sitting in the box at the basement of CMS? Or at the time it was called HICFA. So um, so there are a lot of provisions that started with the Tri-Caucus's vision for you know, how health equity can be achieved in this country through legislation that have seen the light of day and became law. And we've seen some similar ones. I mean, there were things that were in the CHIP reauthorization that were included. Um, that are now a law that started in in the uh, Tricaucus Health Disparities Bill. And then we also saw several provisions that were in the High Tech Act of 2009 that started in the uh, Tricaucus uh, Bill that are now law. So that's just the brief sort of history of um, the Health Equity and Accountability Act. 
I will add that you will notice that at the beginning in 2003, it was called the Healthcare Equality and Accountability Act, um, and the name changed uh, two Congresses later. There's a reason for that. Um, since 2009, I believe it's been called the Health Equity and Accountability Act because um, the way that this bill has been drafted, it's very collaborative. Everybody gets pulled in, and it really is, and it's become a very organic process because it follows the data. It follows the feedback that all the offices get from folks who are on the ground who are saying, this is what I'm seeing in my community or this particular legislation, legislative initiative that was implemented is missing the mark. These are new trends we're seeing. And so it changed because as we started to learn more about health disparities and health equity and health inequities, um, there was great recognition that they are not the same. They're not synonyms. You know, Health disparities and health inequities are very different things. And disparity and inequity are very different things. And the, the root challenges and, and forces that you have to deal with are also very different things. And so there was a name change to reflect that. Um, during that time as well, we recognized that it was really important to apply a very intersectional approach because it wasn't just about how much melanin you have. <laughs> there are so many other factors that affect, that are more social, if you will, but that directly affect your health and wellness and your chance at, at, at wellness and health and also your likelihood for, for premature mortality. And so the health equity name change allowed and reflected the changes that pulled in um, every subpopulation group affected by health disparities and or health inequities because there really is power in number, number one. And number two, a lot of the root causes were very similar. So that just want to explain the name change, but it went from being a bill in 2003 that focused heavily on race, ethnicity, and then sort of, pro I'll just say progress and evolved into a bill that now pulls in and looks at the intersection that cuts across race, ethnicity, um, disability, age, um, sex, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, language, SES, and geography. And so it's very, very all encompassing. Um, but because of that, you know, I, I personally feel that everyone has a reason to get behind this legislation because everybody has a, has a stake in it. And so that's one of the things of, that one of the messages that has come out of this bill over the the last, you know, <laughs> what, ten Congresses, um, but one that the Tri Caucus has been consistent in communicating. So with that background being given, this year's session, this this congressional session, the bill was led by KPAC. Um, and I'm going to punt it over um, to the panelists who are incredibly esteemed and patient, um, and they will speak to that. But I wanted to take the time to first sort of open it up a little bit with a couple of questions for them, um, you know, just to sort of get the conversation going. So the first question is for everyone to answer. I don't have an order, but, you know, could you describe your respective organization's role um, in developing the health care, no, sorry, the Health Equity and Accountability Act um, this year. Happy to go first. Hi, everyone. I'm Casey Lee, the policy director for KPAC. And to kind of give a little bit background of our caucus, um, we are essentially the voice of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders in Congress, as Britt has previously mentioned. I'm just making sure that any legislation that we work on and help pass reflects the concerns and needs of our communities that are extremely diverse. Um, I don't have to really say it for the group here, but we have so many different racial and ethnic subgroups as part of the AANHPA umbrella. So making sure that we are representing as best as we can the voices of our communities on the Hill. Um, our chair is Rep. Judy Chu of California's 28th District. And we have in Congress 22 AANHPA members in total. But as Britt mentioned, KPAC is very unique in its structure with almost 80 members, uh, part of our caucus this time around uh, by cameral, so both House and Senate, and um, also includes members, you know, again, of AANHPI descent, but also who may not necessarily belong in those communities, but may have a strong presence or, you know, loud voice of communities in their districts. So actually, it's um, very interesting because we have the CBC chair and CHC chairs as uh, KPAC associate members um, as well. And you'll see many other CHC, CBC members um, on our website as part of our membership. Um, 
And so as it pertains to HIA, again, as Britt mentioned, the Tri-Caucus takes turns every Congress to introduce this very landmark bill. And so for the 118th Congress, our role at KPAC was to support uh, the sponsors, which are Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who is one of KPAC's two healthcare task force co-chairs, our other co-chairs, Rep. Ami Barra. And then uh, the senator leading the Senate companion is Senator Maisie Hirono, um, a KPAC executive member. And of course, all of this um, updating and redrafting of the bill was done in very close partnership and collaboration with the community working group. And, you know, we'll get to the nuts and bolts of that exactly process maybe in a little bit, um, but just wanted to shout out Adam and Joyce on this call right here as uh, kind of the chairs of the community working group for this Congress um, as the representatives of APCHO and Health Forum. Um, but before I pass it to one of them, I do want to say that KPAC works on a host of many other issues as well. In addition to health equity, we cover civil rights and voting rights, education, immigration, housing, veterans, armed services, everything, just with the angle of how does this affect AA and HPI communities. Um, so with that, I'll pass it to one of my colleagues here, Adam or Joyce. Thank you, Casey. Um, so the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, or um, as we lovingly say, the Health Forum, has had a very long history with HIA. Um, we were part of the community working group when it was first introduced by the late Congress um, and Cummings, and also Congressman Honda. So um, when KPAC took the lead in the um, 115th, sorry, not 115th, um, 109th intro, um, the Health Forum was the community lead, and we were able to work um, in joint step with KPAC in 2011 and 2018, and then co-lead with APCHO this year as well. Um, as a community working group lead, the Health Forum works with um, a vast majority of community working partners, including national and state level partners. Right now, I think we are over 400 um, on bill revisions and really work on providing feedback on every iteration of HIA. Um, that's actually one of the special parts about HIA. It's one of the only, well, few pieces of legislation where communities really have impact, really have a voice because we want to make sure that everyone is heard throughout the entire process. Um, and then I will turn it over to Adam. Thanks so much, Joyce. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Adam Carbolito, as was mentioned, Director of Policy and Advocacy with the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, or APTRO for short. I'll throw out a, another acronym. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're a national nonprofit uh, that works to improve health status and outcomes for medically underserved Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders throughout the US, the US territories, and the freely associated states, mostly through our member community health centers. And uh, one of the reasons why APCHO really supports HIA is really what we've been talking about. Healthcare is a human right, and we have various challenges that underserved communities experience um, that really need to be addressed in every sector of the healthcare, uh, the healthcare system. And we do appreciate our, uh, you know, our collaboration with the Health Forum in leading the community working group this year. Um, it's the first time I think that APCHO has co-led the community working group, but it really is because it is a monumental task to write this bill um, and coordinate, as, as Joyce was mentioned, 400 uh, individuals spanning uh, more than, I think, 150 uh, state, local, and national organizations that span the provider uh, perspective, patient perspective, civil rights perspective, um, and disability and, uh, and disease perspective. So it really is, as Joyce was mentioning and Casey was mentioning, um, a labor of love uh, to coordinate all of these organizations, um, but it but but it, it it's important because it does gain the perspective of so such a diverse um, uh, a diverse set of uh, set of voices that we uh, that we hope uh, you know bring to the table so that they can feel that they are heard during the process um, and also so that priorities affecting the very diverse communities that our country has 
are incorporated into this bill. Um, as Brett mentioned, it's over 1,700 pages long. It spans 10 titles um, that really do dive deep into the various aspects of the healthcare system. Um, and we can get into a little bit more about those. But you know, for APTRO's role, it was really in, in co-leading the community working group, organizing uh, the various organizations uh, that contributed to this bill, as also working with uh, with KPAC, with Senator Hirono's office, with Congresswoman Lee's office, in uh, in um, in finalizing the legislative text, working with the uh, with both chambers, um, legislative councils, and being that liaison between the congressional offices and the um, and the community working group to ensure that all changes uh, both reflect what is needed in community, but also reflect the the needs and the priorities of members of Congress who also um, put their priorities into this bill. Great, thanks. So I think, um, thank you for, for everyone who responded. I think that, you know, we touched a little bit about the process, but I do want to say that, and we were talking about this before this webinar started, this process, I think this, for this, during this session, this particular bill was, um, it was noticeably very, very collaborative. And it was clearly very, very deliberate um, in a very good way on behalf of the organizational leads. Um, you know, this is Joyce and Adam and Casey was right there. Um, and I think that, it was so important for folks who hadn't felt engaged, hadn't felt heard, had a perspective that was very valid, who hadn't weighed in before to be a part of the process. And I think that there was a lot of um, relief and uh, validation when folks were able to sift through the different 10 titles and find their contribution to this bill. Can either of you or both of you talk about why that process is so important and what it really did to the development of this bill so that now we have a product that really does um, put a lot of thought and concern into how a variety of health equity and disparity issues are being addressed? Yeah, I can start with that. Um, and I think you're you're right, Brett. This, uh, jury, when, when we were having early discussions about introducing HIA in the 118th Congress, we really wanted to be intentional about, one, getting the process started at the start of the Congress, so that we can give ourselves a long runway to um, to rewrite uh, sections, to, to get community feedback. Uh, so we started that process early. We also wanted to introduce it a little bit earlier than had been done in the past, but because we were intentional about hearing from the various stakeholders who wanted to contribute to this bill, making sure that the text matched the uh, you know, the tone and the needs of communities now. And also, you know, we're, we were coming out of a post-COVID world where so much of the healthcare environment has changed and many pieces uh, were either not as relevant or needed to be updated because of either changes in science or changes in law that were made during the, you know, from the mammoth, mammoth pieces of legislation that were passed during COVID um, and ensuring that uh, all of the legislative tech reflected uh, what is uh, what is the current state. As you were mentioning, we really wanted to make sure that this bill, as we were taking it out of, um, you know, as we were introducing it, was one reflective of community needs and the the voices of community stakeholders, but also knowing that many pieces of this bill could be incorporated into other pieces of legislation, which I really is the strategy of HIA. It's to have a comprehensive set of ideas so that those provisions are ready to go. We spent a lot of time revising the text, making sure that all of the references were and citations were correct so that if committees of jurisdiction or other members of Congress or the congressional leadership wanted to or had a, a piece of legislation that was moving and they wanted to address health disparities and inequities affecting underserved communities, they can turn to HIA, take a provision, incorporate it into whatever is germane in that piece of legislation, and they could be confident that it's ready to go. So we, we really did spend a lot of time doing that as well. Um, and just adding on to Adam, this is actually the first time HIA has been introduced in a bicameral matter. Um, so the first time the Senate introduced its version of HIA was in the 115th in 2018 by Senator Hirono. And so this year, um, we really wanted to make sure that both chambers were in joint step. Um, and that also was one of the reasons why we had to um, move the date a bit back. It's just um, when you introduce in two chambers for a bill this size. Um, but really, we value the expertise of our communities. Um, even though KPAC um, and um, APCHO and Healthform are introducing this session, 
Um, that does not mean that input from other communities are valued any less. It's valued the same amount. Um, and it's really a community effort from organizations that work on healthcare to work on other provisions like data or immigration. So really, um, we have been very fortunate to take the expertise of so many individuals and contributors to this bill. Great, thank you for that. All right, so I wanna move on. The next, the next question I have, which I know that we could spend all year talking about is from your perspective, from what you've seen, how has he evolved over the last 20 years? When we think about the first version way back in 2003, to the version that just dropped recently, how has it evolved and, and what is your take and perspective on that? And, and, and that of the folks that you're talking to on the ground. I'm happy to uh, take that first. Um, so even though I haven't been around since the first drafting of the first iteration of HIA, I think we've seen a lot of you know language change in the health policy space as it relates to um, social determinants of health, as it relates to gun violence prevention and that being considered a public health issue, um, and uh, as well as just environmental justice. So you will see, especially in the last title, um, a lot of provisions regarding that. And one of the things we actually Actually added as well this year is increasing accessibility and ease of accessing um, applications to SNAP. So that is one of the pieces we also pushed for as, um, as, as nutrition as well. Um, but for KPAC and AANHPAC communities specifically, one of the big kind of pillar issues for us is data disaggregation and data equity. Um, as Previously mentioned, again, so many of our communities have a lot of different disparities that um, that they face under the A and HPA umbrella. The needs of the Hmong American community will be so different from the Chinese American community, which will be so different from the Native Hawaiian uh, community. So. Um, Recently, actually, earlier this year, the Office of Management and Budget released updates to its federal minimum data standards for race and ethnicity data collection. And so one of the exciting things that we did in this uh, version of HIA, this Congress, was to mirror those changes because uh, what those standard those revisions to the standards did was actually increase disaggregation of the data collection. Um, you know, we're not going to just see a checkbox for Asian American anymore. We're going to see multiple checks boxes under that um, and a write-in field for if you don't see your population represented in those check boxes. There's also an inclusion of a new uh, Middle Eastern and North African category as well that was part of the new OMB standards. So for HIA this time around, we made sure to update the bill um, to correspond with those uh, revisions that KPAC uh, and many of our members very loudly applauded. Um, so that is just one example of how we continuously iterate on top of HIA. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I think, you know, just to build off what Casey was saying, um, HIA really is a living a living document um, because as, you know, as, as Casey uh, mentioned, you know, as new information, new data comes and new understanding about some of the challenges that communities are facing, um, so, do, so do the provisions to address certain of those, uh, the, those inequities uh, get added to HIA. Um, you know, the, the bill has grown from, you know, I, I don't know what it was back when it was first introduced, but as, I, uh, as has been mentioned, it's now 10 titles long, um, spanning 1700 pages, because it does address uh, a variety of sections. And I think it's important to go through what some of those, uh, what, what those titles are, um, because it really is all, uh, it is all encompassing. Uh, HIA covers data collection and reporting, culturally and linguistically appropriate health and healthcare, uh, health workforce diversity, improving healthcare access and quality, improving health outcomes for women, children, and families, mental health and substance abuse conditions, addressing high impact minority diseases, um, health information technology, account accountability and evaluation in healthcare, and addressing the social determinants of health and improving environmental justice. And, you know, I think that gives you a sense of the breadth, as has been said, of what this legislation seeks to do. Um, it recognizes that there is not one size fits all approach to addressing healthcare in this country. Our communities uh, across <laughs> across the country are not monolith. Um, you know, we say that a lot about the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community, but that it's something that's true about all communities across the country. Is that in order to have correct and the most effective intervention to a patient, 
um, you need to address that patient specifically. You can't just say that this is what the health requirement is, um, but you, you need to really dig down into what is needed by that ind ind individual patient. And that's what HIA seeks to, uh, seeks to address. It is getting um, bringing healthcare to the patient level, to the provider level, and really making health, the healthcare system think about what are some of the dis disparities for, uh, for these different communities and how is it that we can address them. Um, so, you know, that's where I see uh, he evolving. Also, as the legislation changes, it's because pieces, as I, as I said before, have been incorporated un into other pieces of legislation uh, as they were moving. So as those are, are, as those are enacted into law, uh, we want to ensure that it is reflected in this bill and also having Kia as that blueprint, as that underpinning to where members of Congress and, and the committees uh, can turn to if they have a piece of legislation that is moving, um, that they can bring those pieces into those bills um, so that they can be, uh, be enacted into law and brought to the president's desk. Um, and then just following up to Adam and Casey, that's really where the strength of the bill lies is that it's not stuck back in 2003 and it's the same reintroduction of the same bill, that there has been a lot of time to make sure that it is reflective of our country today rather than what it was then. So um, for example, in um, one of the big changes um, from this introduction is actually Title V, where um, the title, it now includes gender diverse people because that is um, one of the top issues now and that we weren't really even talking about in 2003. Um, and Ad Adam mentioned that provisions have been enacted from past sessions. So that um, includes um, specifically um, like the COFA Medicaid reauthorization, which happened through the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. Um, and then also when COFA communities had federal public benefits restored um, earlier this year. So Really, um, there's wins for all communities um, in, under the ACA, Section 1557. Um, so really massive, massive wins. And that might mean the bill gets a little bit shorter for the next reintroduction, but we always have like five, 10, probably more um, additional items added. So the bill will um, shrink, expand in size, but that's also because we're making progress. And that's also because we're looking to see how much more progress we can make for more um, equity um, throughout our healthcare systems. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I think Joyce, just to dovetail one point you made, I think that the bill will fluctuate in size based on not just the progress we make in terms of getting things across the finish line onto the president's desk, but also by expanding the number of voices we're hearing from weighing in on the bill. So it, and to Adam's point, it really is organic and fluid, and it really does follow the current trends. And I think that that's a really important aspect of HIA and, and its sort of evolution since 2003. Um, you know, one of the other questions I have, and this, again, anybody could really answer it. We, we sort of touch upon it, but, you know, the title of this webinar, um, you know, is that we're looking at HIA as a legislative template for equity. So from your perspective and from what you're hearing, you know, how is it a blue a blueprint for health equity. What you know, what do you what are you seeing and what are your hopes in terms of the imprint it will make if it's if portions are passed, you know, at some point in time, but how what is your vision on it having worked on it for as long as you have? Um I can start on this. Um so one of the big parts I think we've all touched upon it um many times is that um really it's a community effort. It's a effort led by communities of color. It's led by members of color. And I think that's one of the very few um, pieces of legislation, which it's such a cohesive, intentional effort, um, which um, it's been a priority for the Tri Caucus. It's been a priority for many of the um, organizations that um, work on health equity. So it's kind of like the best of the best working on this in that there's um, really, um, with the 10 titles, there's a lot of structure we talked about um, during the process of whether we need less titles or whether we need more titles to make sure that we could include everything. It's not just about 
health equity um, as it is in a medical setting, but it's also about how we see communities through data disaggregation, how um, which communities are left behind, and how do we make sure that um, we actually have a insight into what communities need. So it, where do they, like the social determinants of health has been a massive convert, piece of conversation that has changed over the past 20 years. It's really, um, I think, it's, it takes a holistic look at how we view health for the individual. And it also takes a lot of cooks in a kitchen to make sure that um, every individual is reached in some sort, some capacity. And to build off of Joyce and also the previous questions you had, Britt, that I actually forgot to kind of mention the the role of KPAC in addition to this the constant you know uh, exchange of uh, feedback we have with the community working group. Um, we also consult a lot with the other Tricaucus offices as part of. Um, uh, with KPAC leading it this year, we talk with a lot of folks um, who, even though they are not the leads, they are still interested in having the Momnibus Act, those pieces that were updated last time around, making sure the 118th version is also updated in here this time around. So doing those individual touches with so many Tricaucus offices to make sure, like pertaining to your current question right now, that the vision is still kept, you know, living and breathing and forward looking. Um, and for KPAC specifically, when I think about the vision for AA and HPI communities, not only is it data disaggregation, it is also language access, knowing that one third of AA and HPI communities are limited English proficient, um, wanting to expand the available languages that, you know, all of our federal programs, materials, outreach can have, um, and they actually, our communities can understand um, beyond English and Spanish. There are so many other languages that our communities um, can only speak. So language access is a big part of that. And then also uh, the forward looking vision that I have for HIA, as well as incorporating more of the mental health pieces. Um, again, for AA and HPI communities, that is one huge disparity for us. Um, you know, there was Im immense um, impact from the anti-Asian hate that we saw from the pandemic. But even then, our communities have had the lowest rates of utilizing mental health services. So. Um, as, it, as we've talked about the evolution and the vision, we also want to address, you know, what are the barriers to getting mental health care for communities of color, including A and HPI communities. So um, actually, Chair Chu has one of her bills um, included in this version of HIA as well uh, with Senator Hirono. It's the Stop uh, Sigma Mental Health Stigma Act um, that addresses those kinds of cultural stigmas that AA and HPI face um, and making sure that there is linguistically appropriate outreach, culturally competent outreach um, for, for our communities there. Um, I will pause right there because I feel like I just threw a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and just to build off of that, I think what, what, another goal of HIA is to ensure that the health system reflects the diversity of the country, right? And part of that is making sure that there are providers, um, so the workforce diversity uh, section, making sure that there are providers that look like the communities that they serve, and really uh, setting up a pipeline, one, for uh, for programs to support individuals uh, within communities of color to, to enter the health profession, whether that is uh, while they're in high school or college, and developing those pipeline opportunities, but also supporting providers uh, who may go uh, serve in underserved communities to uh, and who likely have uh, huge amounts of medical uh, of uh, of student loan debt um, after they uh, they get out of medical school or or, or nursing school or et cetera, uh, and supporting them so that they can go and serve in communities um, likely uh, where where they grew up. Um, and uh, they speak the language that, uh, that 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 community speaks. They they look like the community uh, that they're serving. Um, and I think part of that is also an awareness that you know the the experiences that they bring in the medical field just helps to make medicine uh, more accessible um, and more deliberate in getting uh, in getting care uh, to patients. Um, and and secondly, it is uh, one of his goals is to understand. Uh, that there are diseases that disproportionately affect 
communities of color and specific communities of color in particular. Um, prior to being uh, a member of, uh, you know, co-leading it in this Congress, uh, APTRA worked very heavily in the high impact minority disease section uh, of this bill um, because we know that there are certain diseases that disproportionately affect Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, whether it's hepatitis B, uh, tuberculosis, diabetes, um, and we all know that obesity is a huge challenge across all communities of color, cardiovascular disease uh, similarly. And so there are specific provisions uh, within HIA that we've worked to incorporate. We've worked across the, you know, the, the disease advocacy um, um, landscape to ensure that, you know, those specific diseases are incorporated into this because of the disproportionate impact that they have on communities of color. So I think, again, it's reflecting uh, having the healthcare system reflect uh, the, the diversity of this country, but also ensuring that when there are certain uh, parts of the healthcare system, uh, the health, uh, you know, the health sector um, that do disproportionately affect our communities, that we are incorporating that into the bill because we need targeted interventions and targeted outreach for our communities. Yeah, thanks, Adam. And thanks for bringing up the whole piece about high impact diseases. I think that, you know, that's something that I can see, you know, in the future um, being a topic or being a, a title that gets added to. I think we all saw it with the gymnast Sunni who has a rare kidney disease that disproportionately disproportionately affects Asian people of Asian descent, you know, and I think it was IGAN. Um, and that's a disease that you could be the healthiest person, which she clearly is, or it, it doesn't matter if you're eating well, if you're working out, if you have Asian descent, you're more likely to come down with IGAN and the, the consequences could be devastating. In her case, she was able to get the help she needed and, um, and literally go on to win gold, <laughs> but other people are not in that same situation. So I think that you know, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. I just want to add another piece of the bill about HIA that I also think I always call it one of the sleeping giants, which is Title IX, um, which is the accountability and evaluation section, because it really does cut across over the entire 1700 pages. I hope it continues to do that, because what it does is it, it through legislation, shores that the government is responsive to and held accountable for, um, you know, their efforts or sometimes lack thereof to reduce health disparities and to reduce health inequities. Um, and it and it also calls attention to the need to expand civil rights in healthcare um, for, so that everyone is protected. Um, and this is especially true for any entity that receives federal finance, you know, federal, federal dollars. I mean, you know, if you really think about it in a crude way, these are individuals taxpayer dollars that are supporting a system and programs that aren't necessarily serving them back well. And there's a real unjust kind of feeling to that to that sort of image, but it also includes things looking at, you know, cars, incarcerated populations, individuals in correctional facilities, um, ensuring that individuals that are that are that are currently in such facilities, um, you know, when you look at the racial ethnic minority communities, you know, these are folks who are in and out. They're not folks who are there for life. And so it's like, what are we doing to ensure that when men and women and, and young people who are in a variety of correctional facilities come out, that they had the health um, both physical and mental health they needed while incarcerated. So when they come out, they're the healthiest person they can be to then go on to become productive in society um, and in their communities. Um, and then also just reporting, just requiring the reporting um, of how these protections are being enforced. What is the plan? How are you going to carry through your role to, um, to really be, to hold entities accountable and then to evaluate that? And I think that that's a really important provision because so much of that is not going on, which is why I think every year that we sit down to start looking at this bill again, this is why we continue to hear a lot of the same stories over and over. So I think that, you know, it really provides an opportunity to con continue to, to ensure that what's included in the next iteration, what is included in this iteration now, but in the next one as well, really reflects what's going on on the ground and what's needed, not just what's going to get the great talking point or the headline, like where, where does the rubber hit the road? Um, and then to one other point I want to say, is I really like that somebody said, and I believe, um, Casey, it may have been you, but I may be mistaken. You talked about how this was, this has always been an effort led by um, a member of a minority caucus. That's so important. And I remember when, um, you know, people were talking about it and there were a lot of members who are not from racial ethnic minority backgrounds, but who also are not a member of the tri-caucus or any of the minority caucuses would point to legislation that they had drafted. And so it's to say that there, it is an issue that a lot of folks are focusing on. But I think what makes the tri caucus effort stand out so much more is that it really is in the spirit of community and weighing in with the community and pulling in the community. But from the member perspective, it really is a message of like, hey, don't do anything legislative, you know, don't do anything kind of 
about us and for us without us because we're here, you know, and we are a force. And so I think that that consistent kind of pressure that they continue to put on has really brought things to where they are, both in the success that we've seen and in the plans we have moving forward. So I just wanted to sort of throw that in there. Um, so I just checked in the Q&A and we still, I don't think that we have any questions that have come in yet. Um, so if folks are listening, please, if you have questions, feel free to throw them out because we'll, we'll throw them out or I'll throw them out to the panel. Um, and I will call on people, you know, if, if no one speaks, but while we're waiting for those, um, you know, one question I do have is, you know, Hia has sort of, you know, accomplished so much and we all recognize that there are so many more strides to take, but we also recognize that this issue of health disparities and health equity is a human right and it cuts across every community in blue and red states and districts. You know, what do you say to people who, or how would you say anything to people who ask why we don't have more bipartisan support? I mean, I know it's been bicameral, you know, we've had numerous Congresses, I know, I think someone earlier was mentioning the first one, but the first one was actually long before that. I don't want to give the late great Senator Kaka any discredit, but in the 112th, he led in the Senate. Before that, there were a couple of ones that CDC members did. But how do we how do we um, work across the political aisle to ensure people know that this is not just a a, 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 de a Democrat issue? This is an American issue. This is a human issue. How do we how do we move forward with that in mind to attract more support to this legislation? I can start. I think there are a couple a couple points that I want to make on on this. First is, you know, uh, members of Congress deal with so many different issues. And as much as we try to uh, get this bill and other health equity issues in front of them, they really do need to hear from constituents and they need to hear from individuals who are um, uh, who really feel passionate about this. So, you know, really encourage that everyone listening to this webinar uh, go talk to your elected officials, uh, talk to them, tell them that HIA and the, the vision, I think what's, what's most important, the vision presented by HIA is a priority for you um, and tell them why, like, you know, share the stories of the health challenges that you, your family, your friends or your community is experiencing, because many times um, that is what is going to resonate with them. As well, as well as presenting the data, but it is those personal stories that are important. Um, secondly, you know, HIA is a vision bill that seeks to address uh, health inequities across the healthcare uh, the healthcare system, um, and there may be pieces of this bill that members may not feel as comfortable with signing on to HIA in its entirety. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not supportive of health equity issues um, writ large. So I think it's, uh, you know, if there are pieces of HIA that you think they should be supportive of, really voice that concern with them and, and get them to um, uh, to go on the record, if not for HIA itself. Uh, although we do hope that every member of Congress will become a co-sponsor of HIA. So please go talk to your members of Congress and tell them to, uh, <laughs> um, uh, to co-sponsor this bill. Uh, it's in both chambers, so there's no excuse. Um, but talk to them about the individual people Pieces that uh, that are important. We also know that you know there are certain organizations that may not be comfortable signing on as an endorsing um, um, uh, organization of HIA as well because of you know uh, again it crosses so many different uh, parts of the healthcare system that there may be one uh, for one reason or another that they may not agree with. Um, but we know that behind the scenes, they are talking to their, their members, they are talking to their communities, and they're supportive of those provisions. And we do hope that that resonates. Again, you know, HIA is the forward-looking uh, vision that we hope every member of Congress will sign on to. But I think it is the vision that HIA puts forward that is absolutely critical uh, so that we can get more of, more of the provisions of HIA be part of other pieces of legislation that may be uh, that may be moving, or have their uh, you know uh, be standalone legislation themselves, and getting members of Congress to support that. Um, so I think you know it is those pieces, but members of Congress really do need to hear from uh, from constituents and from interest groups um, that these are important issues, and we want to see more done on them. Great, thank you. That was a tough question, but I think it's a valid one given the backdrop that we're you know facing right now. So I don't know if um, Joyce or Casey, if you wanted to weigh in on that. Yeah, actually I do. And I was 
you know, looking back at my standalone bill tracker for HIA to see what are the individual member bills that have been included and actually remembered that I came across um, some bipartisan or even Republican led bills as part of that were included in HIA, uh, the Midwives for Moms Act, which increases the number of trained midwives, um, the Caring for Kids Act to permanently extend CHIP. So um, there are pieces of HIA that I think have robust um, support across the aisle. And so those are, you know, examples of opportunities where, you know, we can tease those out, push, include it in kind of moving vehicles elsewhere to really get signed into law. And like Adam was saying, you know, Kia is the visionary blueprint, but that doesn't mean there are very tangible wins that we can um, get through Kia as well. Yeah, thank you for that. And there have been sections of Kia that have been passed into law that was were led on a bipartisan manner. So it is, um, I, I think Adam put it best, where we hope every member will sign on to HIA and that we can pass the bill as a whole. But it um, definitely part of it is members have differences in opinions um, and they might not feel comfortable in endorsing HIA as a whole. But um, it this is something I think that is, um, we, we should also like note that it's led by members of color and that this is the blueprint that we put forth as um, communities of color. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. Um, so I do see I have a question came in. Um, so to the person who asked, I will just say the answer. Yes, there's recordings. This is being recorded. So I'm sure that everyone has a copy of it. So thank you. I should have said that on the front end. That's my fault as a moderator. Um, so I, the only other thing I, I do want to sort of throw out and add is um, for folks who now understand that this is a really collaborative process and the Hispanic caucus will be the lead next session, how any, to anyone listening who was not a part of the process before, but wants to be a part of it, what's the best way to go about getting involved? Like, what did you guys do this time around to get the groundswell of support and how, you know what I mean? Like, what's the best, best way for someone to engage, you know, for the next congressional session? Well, I think first and foremost, join the HIA listserv. Um, it is really where we uh, share information about this bill and other health equity issues um, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, and other health equity issues uh, with the individuals who are part of this. So uh, to get on it, you can email uh, Joyce Sarai uh, and we will make sure that you're in uh, included into this. Second is, you know, uh, start, uh, continue to to talk about and to champion health equity issues. Uh, we we really do want this to be that collaborative process that it was and we uh, you know we we want to hand off uh, here to the CHC um, in a way that that does uh, take all the lessons learned that we had in introducing it in this Congress and uh, building it for uh, for the introduction in next Congress. The bill is going to likely change from its introduction uh, between the Congresses, so do get involved. But I think, you know, step one, join the HIA listserv. That's really where we're going to share information. That's where we have signups for uh, for the community working group that is um, uh, yeah, uh, that that does take uh, take leadership in in rewriting the bill. Every uh, every community working group is organized differently uh, depending on who is who is leading it. Um, but we want to give uh, and hand off to the CHC and whatever organization on the on the community side is going to be leading it. Um, uh, you know the 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 product that we have. Um, and all of that information. So, you know, uh, if you are interested in getting involved, you know, let let Joyce and me know, um, and we will make sure to get you incorporated into that listserv, um, as well as uh, uh, more information will be shared as as the CHC does take this up in the next Congress. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Anybody else want to? Okay. All right, so I think we're actually at time. So I will take the last minute to open the floor if Joyce or Casey or Adam wanted to say anything we wrap this up. I I will just say on the front end, thank you to everyone who who dialed in on a Friday. Appreciate it. It's a beautiful day, at least in DC. So thanks for sitting in front of your computer for an hour. Um, and thank you to the panelists for sure um, for joining us today. But I want to throw it to all of you as well so that you can sort of wrap up and say thank you or whatever closing marks you may have. First off, thank you so much, NFQF 
NMQF for having us all here today to talk about HIA. It really has been a close partnership with not only yourselves, but I think probably many people tuning in as well. So just wanted to extend my appreciation. Um, and, you know, even though CHC is leading it next time around, KPEC will certainly be involved um, very much so. So also re feel free to reach out to me if anyone in this call is interested in talking more about HIA. Uh, standard house email address is my full name. Thanks, Casey. Um, echoing Casey, we really appreciate the leadership and also partnership of um, several of the folks on a call. Um, and also NMQF, um, Brett, you led Title IX and have been incredible like throughout the entire process, both like with institutional knowledge of the bill um, and then also, of course, um, making sure that um, it like keeping us accountable as well and making sure that's inclusive. So really it's a whole community effort. It's, um, we appreciate um, you all. I put Adam in my email in the chat. Um, please reach out to us if you have any questions about um, this iteration of HIA, if you want to join the community working group, we really appreciate you all. And I'll just, you know, to wrap up, um, you know, th this, th these issues are are extraordinarily personal for for all of us. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, I'm a native Chamorro from Guam who is working in health policy here in D.C. And you know that part of that part of the work and why uh, I uh, and what I bring to to this table is the personal experiences of you know the challenges of of a U.S. territory. Uh, and all the the, the things um, uh, that that our communities are experiencing there, and I know that everyone, as part of the community working group, the congressional staffers, the members themselves, um, health is so personal to each of us, um, and we want to see the healthcare system develop in a way that is more reflective of the, of our communities, and that's what really what HIA does. Um, and we hope that you know we were able to provide some information to you today about why we think that this is the blueprint for health equity uh, in this country, um, and we hope that you will you will join us in uh, in this cause um, because it is so personal, so important, um, and it is only through our partnership and collaboration together that we're going to get uh, movement on these issues. So, uh, you know, I want to thank everyone for tuning into this webinar today. Uh, thank you to Britt, to Brandon, to NMQF for hosting the webinar here, getting, you know, more attention and awareness of this bill out there. And I'm going to throw a challenge to everyone on this webinar and everyone uh, viewing the recording to please contact your members of Congress, tell them to uh, co-sponsor this bill um, and let them know that this is a priority issue for you because they really do need to hear from you. Uh, there's so much going on in Congress. They are inundated with so many different things. But if we can get more people talking about HIA, more people getting to their members of Congress and letting them know that this is a priority, uh, we want to see uh, additional movement and additional support from all members. So please do, uh, uh, I really do. And endorse the bill uh, <laughs> uh, from uh, from an organizational aspect, endorse the bill. I know uh, we have a, a sign-up form um, and we do want to list as many organizations as possible so that when we are going to members, uh, we are demonstrating the broad support for this piece of legislation. All right. Well, um, sorry, Joyce, you want to say something? Oh, I was just going to jump on um, Adam saying endorsing the um the bill, this is actually something that we had conversations about and we have kept the endorsement for the bill open. Um, so if folks do want to join, even though the bill has been introduced, we um, would love to add you. All right, well, thank you very much. And I'm gonna just leave it at that. The last, the, the challenge issued by Adam for folks as we sign off, I think it's a great challenge and one that everyone can rise to meet. Um, and just thank you again to everybody. I know, Brandon, if you're still on, if you wanted to say a final goodbye since you opened the webinar. Is Brandon already logged off? He may have been gone. Okay. Um, so again, another big thank you to everybody, obviously to the team that is on this call. Um, I certainly look forward to working with all of you next Congress on this and certainly anybody listening, please, you know, um, you know, come to the table. I mean, we, you know, we'll make room. We got extra seats um, and your voice is, is, is definitely needed and wanted and welcome. So um that being said um thank you very much everybody and have a great friday and a great weekend and be safe bye